I'm Chuck Stout, curator of the Wings Over the Rockies Air and Space Museum, and today we're going to go behind the wings of a three-engine passenger airliner that first flew in 1926, the Ford Trimotor. We're going to explore the design and development. We're going to walk around and look it over, and then we're going to get to fly this piece of Art Deco history. This is what you would have seen in 1929. This one's going to be cool. It's time to go behind the wings. This is our second facility here at Exploration of Flight at Centennial Airport. Here you can come to wonderful fly-ins and see interactive exhibits. But today we have an extra special treat, a Ford Trimotor. Let's take a closer look. William Bushnell Stout was a forward-thinking and innovative engineer who began building airplanes out of metal when almost all new airplanes were made from wooden fabric. He had already designed some moderately successful commercial airplanes when his three-engine Stout Trimotor caught the eye of Henry Ford, the inventor who had put America on wheels with the Model T Ford. Henry Ford knew that aviation had great promise and was going to grow quickly. He bought the Stout Metal Airplane Company in 1924. Now as Ford's engineers refined the design of the trimotor, Bill Stout started Stout Airlines, possibly the nation's first scheduled airline. Stout left Ford in 1930, but went on to become the director of Convair's research division during World War II. Ford's engineers improved the design of the Stout trimotor and Ford's marketing made sure the airlines and potential passengers knew that the Ford Trimotor was rugged, reliable, and safe. Sales started in 1926, and almost 200 Ford Trimotors were built before production ended in 1933. The Ford's primary competitor was the Fokker Trimotor, a similar Trimotor designed and manufactured from wood by the famous Dutch airplane builder Anthony Fokker. A high-profile crash of a Fokker trimotor caused by deterioration of the wood joints and laminations gave a major boost to Ford and the all-metal Ford trimotor. An airshow pilot named Harold Johnson performed aerobatics in a Ford trimotor, adding further to their reputation for strength and reliability. The Ford 4AT carried 10 to 12 passengers and had three right whirlwind engines. The Ford 5AT carried 13 to 17 passengers and had three 420 horsepower Pratt & Whitney Wasp engines, a longer span, and the airplane's fuselage was longer too. The Ford Trimotor carried up to 10 passengers and pioneered the idea of carrying a crew member to provide care and service for the passengers. The first flight attendants were called stewardesses. They had to be registered nurses and they had to be single. If you got married, you got fired. The cruise speed was around 100 miles per hour, and the cruising altitude was usually below 10,000 feet. For people in a hurry, TAT, the forerunner of TWA, offered coast-to-coast -coast service in a breathtaking 48 hours. Flying at night was still pretty dangerous, so the passengers flew during the day, then boarded trains for the nighttime parts of the trip. Now we're lucky to have this airplane. It's very rare. There are less than 10 of these things still flying but we've got something even better. We've got tri-motor pilot, Bill Thacker. Bill, glad to meet you. And first question is always, how'd you get into flying? I was growing up watching, you know, the whirly birds and ripcord and all that. Every aerial maneuver is real. How could you not get into aviation? As a matter of fact, there were more GA airplanes built in the early 70s, you know, than any other time in history. And that's when I came of age. So that's how I got into flying. Can you give us a little bit of background about tri-motors in general? and this specific airplane in particular? But the airplane uh, has lived a, a wonderful life. It's, it's pushing 100 years old. This airplane, when it was born in, in August of 1929, it went to Eastern Air Transport and was one of their first airplanes, and it was definitely their first transport category airplane. It spent only, only a little over two years at Eastern. The DC-3 came out. You know, and the Boeing 247 came out, so the, the performance, you know, upgrade was significant enough that the airlines switched fairly quickly away from the tri-motor. Tri-motors then started to move on, and this one went just a little bit south of Miami. It went down to, to Cuba and into Havana specifically, where it was the, the flagship, the first uh, passenger airliner, and even called Air Force One for the island of Cuba, and the airline that now is known as Cubana. And so it lived down there for quite a while. It flew almost 20 years down there before migrating back to the United States and then living a life of barnstorming and fire jumping and ride hopping. And it's a movie star, by the way, yeah. 
a short history of the trimotor and, and why and how it was developed is that uh, Henry was looking for something for his son Edsel to do. Most of the credit is placed towards Henry, but Edsel was the big driver. He was the one that really wanted to create an airline industry. In order to do that, he knew that the people that he was going to fly were risk adverse. They were people that had money and they weren't going to climb into a tube and fabric airplane like was hauling the mail at the time. And they did, by the way, haul passengers, but the passengers were subordinate to the mail. So if there was too much mail, the people got booted. This was a paradigm shift. So then what Edsel did was he looked around, he bought the whole company called Stout Metal Aircraft Company. He bought that lock, stock and barrel, moved the whole thing to Detroit and built a hangar there. And the first paved runway in the world was there in Dearborn. And he um, started building trimotors. The Ford trimotor itself actually bird the airline industry. There are no legacy carriers in existence today that doesn't owe their history and their founding to the Ford Trimotor. Okay, now that we've heard a little bit about the airplane, why don't we look around and see what it's all about? Well, let's go take a look at it, huh? So there's a reason that this airplane's called the Trimotor. It's got three. So tell us a little bit about the engines, Bill. Now these engines are not the exact engine that was on it when it came out of the factory in 1929, out of Dearborn, but they're very similar. These are Pratt & Whitney R985 engines for the airplane geeks out there. They put out 450 horsepower each as their supercharged. The original engines on a lot of the Trimotors, most of the others had Pratt & Whitney's, and a lot of them were 985s, but they didn't have the superchargers, so they were only 400. We change one engine a year is what our target is, so they'll last for us three years. None of these engines are more than three years old. So let's go look on the side. I notice that the flight control cables are on the outside of the airplane. Can you tell me why they chose to do that? Simplicity was absolutely necessary to time. If you think about it, there was not a lot of mechanics around. So another design criteria was that they had to be able to be maintained by a mechanic coming out of the Ford garage, so you had to put the cables on the outside. Plus, it was a lot simpler. Now, the aileron cables, you don't see them outside, so this is just elevators and rudder. They had a pretty blank slate to work from, not a lot of data points when they build the Ford Trimotor, and you can see that when you look around at it, that all the bits and pieces that are hanging off the outside. Yeah, no question about drag when you got seven struts holding the engine <laughs> Yeah, up. that's uh, for sure. So let's talk about the landing gear. It's pretty cool, it's special. You know, th this landing gear here is actually designed, and so we credit a local Denver boy, Al Mooney, with designing the rubber donut that came along after this airplane was built. This part, which is the shock strut, is what almost all of them are now are converted to this system, which is a lot safer, easier on the tires, and a lot nicer landing. These brakes are modern. They're still manufactured today. As a matter of fact, th this particular model of brake is used on the spray planes that you see now on air tractors. And so that's where this come from. And honestly, we don't really use the brake too much. One thing uh, we can say about a Ford is we don't have to worry about being too fast. So I noticed that the engine instruments aren't necessarily on the panel. <laughs> no, they're, they're not. What I have up here on each of my pylon engines, which is engine number one and engine number three, I have a tachometer, oil pressure, and oil temperature. You know, and it's a practical reason, just like the practical reason for the cables being on the outside, is that uh, a tachometer works off of a speedometer cable that's plugged into the back of the engine. And you would have to run that speedometer cable up and through, and would you put it outside, inside? Where are you gonna put it, you know, for it to be able to be read in, inside the cockpit? Primary engine instruments, especially when you get horsepower this much, is manifold pressure. I do have manifold pressure right in front of me on the pilot, and that's how I actually set the power. It's kind of cool though, huh? It is. Yeah. You know, another thing that's unusual about the Ford Trimotor is the way that they configured the tail on it. More modern airplanes, they put trim tabs on there. Well, the Trimotor did a little bit different, and you can kind of see it. If you look on the trailing edge of the stabilizer, which is the leading edge of that elevator, and there's actually a jack screw back there. And so right by between the head of the co-pilot and the pilot, there's a crank up there. I'm up there cranking away because one crank doesn't do much. You got to give it about a dozen cranks to make a difference. Now, an interesting thing too, if you look on the rudder, there's no trim tab on it. As a matter of fact, there's no rudder trim. So it's one of the only multi-engine airplanes that I know that doesn't have rudder trim on it. So this has been a great exterior walk around. Let's go inside. Okay, we're going back to 1929 because this is what you would have seen in 1929. Come on, watch your head.
the pictures I see from the 20s show people munching their sandwiches in wicker seats. This looks pretty <laughs> deluxe here. This is, yeah, this is the first class version. I see that there's a, an exit up here. <laughs> there is. That's a fueling hatch. Well, this works just like a conventional airplane. And so I've got three tanks up there, 103 gallons in each main tank, and I got 27 gallons in my reserve tank. I take a wooden stick, okay, which measures the amount of fuel in it, and then I can calculate how many gallons I need to add. So shall we look in the cockpit? Let's do that. We're in the cockpit of the tri-motor and I see mixtures and throttles, but I don't see prop pitch. Yeah, we don't have them. They, these have what's called ground adjustable props. So they actually have clamps out there on the blade route. And so uh, a mechanic would set those, the angle of that prop to get the desired uh, pitch that we want on the prop. So they're fixed pitch. So basically to fly a tri-motor, you, you grab a handful of throttles there and you push them forward. I've got tow brakes on the left side. We don't have any brakes on the right side. This is a single pilot airplane. I've got carburetor heat here for my number two engine. Up on the back panel back here, I've got carburetor heat for the, for the pylon engines. This the is a trim, trim crank. crank, yeah. And see, you notice how it's parked right now. There's never a flight that somebody doesn't ask me what I'm doing with this crank. <laughs> okay, that's what I'm doing. It's been great learning a little bit about this thing, but now the part that we've all been waiting for, let's go fly it. This Come is on. terrific. You lead the way. What are the flight characteristics like? There's a lot of asymmetric yaw for them because the wings are so long and the ailerons are out there. And the rudder is very, very, very stiff. It works very well, but it's like leg day at the gym. You gotta really mash it. The elevator is very sweet. It's extremely sensitive and flies well. Speeds on the airplane is there's only one speed and that's 80. You take off at 80, you climb at 80, you cruise at 80, you descend at 80, and you land at 80. And I'll tell you, it's absolutely fantastic to fly. Wow, that was a Thumbs peak up. experience. Well, Bill, thank you ever so much. I really appreciate you coming out. I really appreciate what you do. You're making huge memories for lots of people, and that's really important. You bet. My pleasure, Chuck. It's a blast for me to do. I mean, how could it not be the pinnacle of an airline pilot's career? So we know we couldn't get to everything, but if you have questions, please put them under the video here and we'll get to as many as we can. Now, also, we're at Exploration of Flight, our second facility for Wings Over the Rockies. This is the site of wonderful fly-ins and terrific events. So come on out here. And if you come to the regular museum at Lowry, we've got more than 70 iconic airplanes there. Great place to visit. Now, if you're a subscriber, thank you. If you're not a subscriber, hey, come on, subscribe already.